So today, I'm going to talk about uh, two topics, the giants of New Zealand and the famed um, Yeti or the Bigfoot, um, known as the Moiho Man. So the earliest recording of giants um, occurred at a time of the visit to New Zealand from Abel Tasman, the Dutch explorer. Um, he came out in 1642 with his two boats, um, but he never actually set foot on our shores because he, he got down to Golden Bay in the top of the South Island, was got chased away by, by hostile natives. He decided it wasn't a good idea to arrive. So he made his way back up north and in January of 1643, he, um, they decided that they would stop in at the Three Kings Islands, um, you know, just uh, 55 k's north of Cape Reinga. They decided to drop anchor and head ashore to get fresh water and seek and, and get wood. But they looked ahead and they saw uh, these two men on these rocks. So this, the scene is actually sketched by the ship's artist, Isaac Gilsiman, shows the two ships, the Zehain and the Hemskirk, and in front of them at the top of the hill are two giant warriors with spear, spears, one standing still and the other one looking to gesture them away. So they took that as a threat and sailed away. Now there's much, there's been much debate from then and ever since about whether these, um, whether this drawing was drawn to scale or not. Like did he draw them slightly larger to highlight them as if, um, or did he, did he, if he draw, drew them to scale, that'd be difficult to see. But he, if he drew them, um, uh, you know, emphasising that there were these giant warriors on the hills, um, then it's, uh, the, the, he's done it to effect. But there's nothing in the reports at the time when he went back to the Netherlands that there were definitely giants, but there were a lot of people that, that looked at that picture and saw, oh, heck, there are giants in that, in that country. And I wonder, you know, the, I don't know what the response was or whether there were any further investigations at the time, but... Um, I don't know, and I don't know whether that had anything to do with, with New Zealand not being visited by Europeans again for another, another century. Um, as New Zealand became settled by Europeans, there's talks of giants roaming around the country as, as even as late as the 1830s. So this is a, um, a drawing that I managed to come across at archives of the Battle of the Balcott Farm, which occurred just prior to the New Zealand war, the land wars, and, and this was, was taken in 1846. So it's unlikely that this one has been drawn to scale either, unless the poor chap here is very little, but it's likely that it was done to promote some sort of effect. Um, people like to think that there were some, you know, giant, giant warriors and possibly used for scare tactics. When this skirmish actually occurred in 1846, there was only 16 years had passed since the last recorded sighting of a giant Maori warrior. So it can be assumed that the last, last of them actually died out around 16 years before or in recent years. So there are a lot of theories, but the common theory is the giants were, um, were of the Waitaha tribe. They were the first to come to the country by canoe from Hawaii around 1350 AD. And the Waitaha were said to be really peaceful people. And I think this is probably their downfall. Um, tribal warfare as more canoes arrived and the, and the country was being settled. Tribal warfare, warfare killed them off or drove them from their homes. There were lots of sightings and even bones of people unearthed, said to be nine foot tall, have been found, found around the Northland. And large bones found on Great Barrier Island caves in recent years. And could they be related to these giants in Gilsman's picture? The Ngāti Whātua in Northland came to see Kafaru of Kafia. He stood 2.7 metres tall to, he, and they got him to assist them in territorial battles. And there, there exists accounts of him striding across the Kuiper Harbour at low tide. And the Ngāpuhi talk of Tiputi, who's said to have eyes as big as power shells. By means, their size meant that they were sought out as prized fighters, such as Takao, who was captured by Te Raupraha in 1830, but was let go because of his, um, he was impressed by his mana. But as tribal warfare spread, the Waitaha people were driven south um, where they settled in pockets around Kaiapu in Canterbury. And in 18, 1898, Dr. Symes, uh, respected um, GP, stumbled on massive jawbone in the sandhills in Dallington. It was a well-preserved and there were several massive bones felt um, close by, very, very well-preserved. And the D Dallyman, Dallington man, revived interests in, um, interests in giants. So every so often um, in the media back then, it was 
it, it was revived whenever there were you know um, bones found or um, things like that. So a little close to my home, I'm, I'm originally from Te Awamutu, which is just slightly south of Hamilton. Um, I grew up knowing this this hill here. Um, I mean, it just looks like any other hill, but it's well known to us locals as Giant's Cave. So it's just slightly south of Te Awamutu on the way to Otrahonga on State 3. And it's, um, if, if you know the area, you, you just go past the old Tokanui Hospital and then you turn right at the Tikawa Crossroads. And there are three giant trees there, uh, sorry, trees, three giant hills there called the Three Sisters. And on top of the second hill, uh, there's a well-fortified power of the Ngāti Rokawa, of which lived Kiharoa, a fearsome warrior standing four metres tall and wielded a, 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 a taiaha that no one could lift because it was so heavy and big. The Ngāti Rokawa had a long-standing ongoing feud with the Ngāti Maniapoto of Te Omutu. So one morning in 1812, the Maniapoto launched a surprise early morning attack on the pa. Um, now, there's several versions to this story. Um, the version known to, to most people in, in our area is that Kiharoa was woken by the attack, and uh, they were far from organised. And he ran down the as he ran down the hill, he slipped and he tripped over and broke his taiha, which is a bad omen. And and he was actually um, overcome and killed, and his victors ate him where he lay, and they took his head off as a prize and buried his bones, hence Giant's Grave. Um, the, the alternative version to that story was uh, is told from um, the old Anglican, the first Anglican minister in Te Aumutu, um, and is carried off down by settlers who said that during the attack, he was actually challenged to a fight from a smaller warrior called Tutanui, and it was agreed that a hole would be dug so that it would be of equal height to each other, and Kiharao would jump in the hole and he would be of equal height and they would have their combat hand-to-hand um, -hand combat, but Tutanui ran around and around and around and got Kiharoa dizzy, and as he was running faster and faster and faster around the hole, he kept prodding him with his spear, and um, and he was soon overcome and dispatched and um, eaten and buried there. So um, two alternative versions to that story, but even, as I say, even today, that 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 hill is, n is still known as Giant's Grave. Um, Tutanui, by the way, was quite a, a small warrior, and he was later instrumental in leading the attack against the uh, Pa on One Tree Hill and took that. Um, even in recent years, there's been large bones, nine foot tall or nine foot high found. And when I did the research for this chapter, um, I met and talked to contractors building the expressway found um, you know, between Hamilton and Auckland. And they've said to me, you know, that there are, there have been these giant bones, um, and it's, it's they have actually news of that have have actually made the news. But by the time archaeologists archaeologists get there, twenty four hours later, they've gone, and nobody would say, you know, who took them and why, which is, you know, real. You got to you got to be a bit suspicious about that, and you have got to wonder why. I mean, in my twenty years of doing crime research, I'm pretty good at getting information from. You know, sources like the police, um, you know, access to, to a lot of those police files from the books that I've written. Um, but I'd say that my inquiries in trying to find out what happened to these giant bones probably been the most frustrating I've ever had in 20 years because it, I just hit brick walls constantly. Um, now, I'm not a conspiracy theorist by any means, but I can't work out why um, the authorities would want to suppress this. Um, I can't imagine that there, there would be any threat to anybody. I mean, if they were made, in my view, if they were made available to experts, we'd able to, we'd be able to learn and understand more about our history, answer a lot of questions about who, you know, who who came here first and what they were like, if there were indeed any giants. Um, and I mean, even though it's out of my field of expertise, I kind of feel that you know we're robbed of not being able to know. Right, second part of my talk is um, about the famed Moiho man. Okay, so this is a different kind of giant. So the Moiho man is New Zealand's version of Bigfoot or the Yeti. He's a composite description of a hair, large hairy hominid with long powerful arms that reach past the knees and long bony fingers, which he uses to spear fish and catch prey. The earliest reports of such a beast was in 1844 when the esteemed Dr. David Munro, it's funny how all these people that cite these giant beasts are doctors, 
Um, Dr. Munro was he was highly respected and he later became a Minister of uh, Parliament and Speaker of the House of Representatives. But in 1840, he was a um, amateur explorer. He recorded seeing what he called the Mairoero, um, and, and I'll probably pronounce that wrong, Mairoero, and described it as a wild man of the woods, strong, cunning, mischievous, addicted to running off with damsels and young people, his body covered with coarse, long hair, which flows down from the back of his head, nearly to his heels. And to compensate for the excessive quantity behind his forehead was bald. He had fingernails of such length they could kill weckers by thrusting their fingers at the birds and impaling them and scraping the feathers off the birds and using toasting forks over the fires. He lived in, or they lived in caves in Otago and around the foothills of the Remarkables and Lake Wakatipu areas. And their presence seemed to be accepted and um, seen by a, a lot of people, at the settlers at the time, albeit with some uh, air of caution. There are an awful lot of recorded sightings um, in the South Island from the mid 19th century. So it was thought that numbers dwindled and died off around about the same time as the giants were last seen. The latter part of the 19th century, there were sightings of a similar looking beast stalking the Coromandel Peninsula. So this came at a time of the 1870s where gold was discovered in the Coromandel Peninsula. And uh, in and within years saw the arrival of, of hundreds of prospectors to the area, to the Thames goldfields. And there were a lot of stories, not just one, but of several long-haired man-beasts flanking prospectors, seen using primitive tools in the bush. Um, there were stories of these hairy ape-like monsters carrying off settler children while they were playing. Um, There's another of a woman being dragged uh, from her shack, uh, and then her body was found and her neck had been snapped. There was another story dated specifically to 1882 of a prospector at the Martha Mines and why he had been partially found partially devoured with his head ripped off. Now you'd think these would make major headlines, you know, even though this is the days of no computers and internet and TV, but there were still a lot of newspapers around back then. And um, I read a lot of the local papers. They're all available on Papers Past, if you are aware of that website. Um, it has a lot of... Um, local newspapers, particularly of the Coromandel area. And um, I found no no such mention of, of uh, there were a lot of murders, um, but certainly none attributed to any long-haired big beast um, taking people away. Um, some believed that this the Moiho man did exist, or Moiho men did exist. Others believed they were just myths perpetuated by prospectors not wanting anybody else to come into the area. Um, in the 20th century was when the, um, the beast was given the name, the Moiho Man. And why is he given this, this name? Well, this harks back to the sighting of the beast by two reported doctors uh, who were pig hunting in the Moiho mountain range in the middle of the Coromandel Peninsula um, in, in 1953. Okay, so the sighting was regarded with credence because these men held respective positions, professions. They first described it as a giant gorilla. Now, there was scant recollection then by locals that of a gorilla having escaped from a ship which had moor, moored off Waiaro on the northern part of the peninsula in 1924. I checked this out on Papers Pass too. And there were indeed several ships that had capsized off Waiaro um, between 1924 and 1930. And there were a lot of people rescued, but um, no gorilla or no mention of escaped gorilla. So is this a rumour or did the papers suppressed the full story not wanting to freak out a strictly conservative public. Um, 1953 wasn't the only sighting. Nine, there's one in 1969 of an Australian tourist was tramping in the bush there and saw a creature she said was seven foot tall, covered in silver white hair and large pink vacant eyes. She thought it resembled a gorilla. It had long dangling arms, short thin legs, legs and emitted a low growl. A lot of hunters went in at the time and found nothing. Four years later, hunters spotted a two-metre-tall ape-like creature standing on a ridge 150 metres away from them, but it ran away when it, when, um, when it saw them. They cautiously headed over to the spot and measured footprints of 35 centimetres long. So um, I would doubt that it was that gorilla from 1924. I know that they do live you know, long lives, but I would seriously doubt that um, 
that the gorilla was still there, you know, 30, 30 40 years later. Um, some zoo experts were consulted at the time and they said that if it was a gorilla, that um, the gorilla would um, would nest pretty much in the in the trees where they think that these sightings were of, of this ape-like creature on the ground. And they, they think that it could have been a baboon that escaped, but baboons, again, they've got their own, you know, idiocy, their own special, that's the one. Normally I can say that word. Um, perhaps I better get a drink of water. Yeah. Um, excuse me. Idiosyncrasies, that's the one. And I think that with the amount of people that do tramp in the Moiho mountain ranges, that there would be some obvious um, signs of, of, of their existence. So in 2000, um, uh, re the renowned Australian Yeti hunter, Rex Gilroy, uh, who's travelled around the world and is an expert um, in his own field for investigating Bigfoot sightings, um, he came across two human-sized hominid footprints measuring 46 centimetres long, 29. centimetres wide across the toes and 24 centimetres wide at the heel, found in the Karanghaki Gorge, and this is reasonably close to the Martha Mine, which I mentioned earlier, where there were sightings. Um, miners there claimed they saw um, these creatures living or, or working among them in the 1870s and 80s. So Rex took those imprints. Um, I had a decent talk to Rex um, when I researched this book, and Rex was quite excited talking about this discovery in New Zealand, and he certainly believes that um, if, there is, if there's a lot of effort placed by experts that, um, uh, you know, that they would, there would be a lot more found, um, particularly in the Moiho range. Um, he's desperately wanting to come back, but he's, he was getting on a bit, and, and he had numerous other sightings to follow up on. Um, he's adamant that um, if people are interested, they should head back there, um, and he's more than happy. He's got his own website, but he's more than happy to um, to provide his assistance. So if somebody asks me what I think, um, my thoughts are, I don't know. I, I, as I say, I can't imagine it. It's just one gorilla that's, um, that's there after all these years. But one thing I can tell you is that I do have a number of friends who are right into hunting, and they say that the Moiho range at night um, has the most unusual, freakiest howls and noises, unlike any other bush in the country. And these are sort of these, you know, tough as guts type, you know, swan dry wearing, you know, hunters um, that don't like staying out at night because there there are there are howls and noises that they just cannot explain, and they don't know what it's from. Um, in fact, there are a lot of people in the Coromandel area, um, locals who for whatever reason, um, they are superstitious and they won't tread in there, tread into the bush. There was a commune that was set up there in the 1970s and it didn't last long for the same reason that they um, they didn't particularly like the, it was just an eerie type atmosphere there. Um, so I guess if you want to know an experience for yourself, head down to Coromandel and go camping. <laughs>